Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Telerik. Create compelling app experiences across any screen with the Telerik platform. Telerik's end-to-end platform uniquely combines industry-leading UI tools with cloud services to simplify the entire app development cycle. Telerik offers everything .NET developers need to build quality apps faster. Try it free at Telerik.com slash platform. That's Telerik.com slash platform. From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 459. In this episode, Scott talks with Dart Language founders Lars Back and Casper Lund. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. And on Skype, I've got Lars Back and Casper Lund. Uh, Lars and Kasper are in Aarhus in Denmark, and uh, they work on, uh, amongst other things, the Dart language. Uh, Lars is known for working on V8, and Kasper has a long history in working on virtual machines. Thanks, gentlemen, for uh, joining me today. It's our pleasure. Pleasure, yeah. So the the Dart language is something that it, uh, I've been exploring, and it's been going on now for, what, about uh, four years since you announced it at the GoTo conference? That is correct. It's been a long time. But uh, uh, introducing new language takes a, a while before it gets adopted. So um, it's, uh, it's always a, a long-term project when you introduce new language. When you were on stage and you were presenting it for the first time, are you presenting a concept? Are you presenting a prototype? How baked is it? How, how secretive are you before you make it completely open? We made it completely open uh, from the beginning. So this has been all along a completely open source project. And uh, you can follow uh, minute to minute uh, how we do development uh, in our repository. Uh, so it's uh, it's all open. And um, the main purpose of uh, the Dart programming language and the tools around it is just to make programmers more productive. So we want to make sure that programmers can write big programs uh and they, they can do it in, a, in an efficient way so they don't spend time on uh, hard debugging problems and stuff like that. So Dart is a, a fairly simplistic programming language that's easy to understand, and uh, we believe it scales uh, fairly well to big applications. Is that the primary idea that, um, that, that it is to replace JavaScript, though, that JavaScript is not serving us in large applications, therefore a simpler programming language is required? We, we do see a lot of people uh, that build big things in JavaScript that are struggling, uh, and a lot of different tools come out to try to help that. And I think Dart fits nicely into that niche as well. But at the same time, we are building a general purpose programming language that fits in a lot of places. So I wouldn't call it a JavaScript replacement, but it is an alternative for certain kinds of, uh, of work. So I think it's very important to, to, to also talk about... Uh, the importance of having options when you are a programmer or developer, right? You need to, to use the tools that are best uh, for your needs. And it's clear if you are writing uh, smaller programs for the web, JavaScript is an excellent programming language. And uh, I believe it's even fast nowadays. Um, I wonder who the, worked on that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Who did but, that? But the, um, but the important part is that we could also see that big companies like uh, Google and uh, other ones too, uh, when writing big applications, they were struggling with the complexity uh, and the lack of structure in, in JavaScript. And that was sort of the opening that uh, made us think about uh, creating something that would, that would suit better uh, big projects. So if you had uh, several teams collaborating on a big piece of software, we actually had a programming uh, language here, Dart, that would help uh, facilitate that development work. And y- you could say that uh, a lot of other things have come along since we introduced Dart, like TypeScript and a few others uh, like that. That sort of um, gives us the impression that uh, we're not alone in having the uh, the understanding that building really big things in pure JavaScript is hard work. So getting more structure and more tooling around it is very helpful. So when something comes out like, like TypeScript, do you look upon that as a validation of your concepts or as competition? Where, how do you, as programming language creators, see things like that? Um, I think uh, 
the answer is both. Of course, there's a competitor, uh, and and we we love competition, so it's really nice uh, that uh, to have competitors. So we are on our toes in making a better platform. On the other hand, it also validates that uh, that programmers need choice when doing applications. So uh, I welcome other platforms as well. And and I think the platforms are learning from each other. So I think we are seeing faster improvements to client-side uh, programming tools than we, we did in the past. And that's a very good thing for all developers. So I think we can really keep that up for a while. We can actually improve the uh, state of the art within client-side programming tremendously. So you say client-side programming, but I'm also hearing that you're looking at Dart as being more general purpose. Do you think you'll be writing, you know, can you write node apps in, in Dart and write server-side apps in Dart? In fact, you can already do that today. Um, so if you go to our repository, you can see there's already server packages available. So if you want to, to write servers in Dart, you can do that. And, and we're using that quite heavily ourselves. Um, so like we're, we're using our own tools, of course, to, to learn something about them, but we're building a lot of the, uh, the Dart tooling in Dart itself. And most of those tools actually run, uh, on the command line in a more server side like setting than uh, not really like client apps. So the translator we have that translates Dart to efficient JavaScript is essentially like a, a, a program you run on your workstation. So it's not a client side programming any, in any form. Mm -hmm. So anywhere, anywhere JavaScript, I mean, uh, VM runs, anywhere V8 runs, Dart runs as well. Can you, can you talk about the relationship between JavaScript and V8 and Dart? And does Dart have its own VM or does Dart run on V8? Because you talk about translating Dart to JavaScript. And when I think JavaScript, I think V8. I'm not quite sure about those relationships. So, so again, um, well, the answer is yes and yes. Uh, first of all, it's important to to note that we don't want to break the web, so it's important that we can run in all browsers. And in order to do that, we need to generate JavaScript so that when you have a Dart program, you want to run in in a in a in a browser, we can translate to JavaScript, and it will behave exactly the same if you run it in Safari or or Firefox uh, as well as in in, in Chrome. Uh, on the server side, if you run standalone Dart or on the server, you, you're typically using the, um, the Dart VM. And, uh, we have a fairly good, uh, uh, server, uh, uh, VM. So you can run in 64 bit mode and run with like 16 gigabytes of heaps if that's what you want. Um, and you can process big data. Is the Dart VM a uh, an offshoot? Uh, I'm not sure if offshoot or fork is better than a, a V8, or is it its own you know clean room implementation of, of a new VM for made for Dart only? Oh, this is of course a clean room implementation. Uh, so Dart is fundamentally different than uh, than JavaScript. So JavaScript, when we created JavaScript, it was uh, it was a um, an exercise in making a very dynamic system run fast. And the way we did that was by uh, by cooking up uh, uh, classes on the fly, if you will, uh, to make it run fast. So we, we were creating thousands and thousands of classes behind the scenes while running uh, JavaScript. We don't have to do that in Dart because it's more structured. So all this dynamic behavior we don't we couldn't use for anything, and that also allows us to make a simpler virtual machine that would execute Dart. And we can certainly take advantage of that to make it uh, run faster and scale better. Oh, okay. So the Dart virtual machine, because it is really truly the Dart virtual machine for Dart, it is fundamentally different in the problems that it's trying to solve than from JavaScript. It's not, I would maybe say that in order to support JavaScript, there are probably some hacks that you need to do to make V8 super fast. But on the Dart side, you design the language so you know what your goal is and you can run yeah. faster. <laughs> That's exactly a simple right. example of that is that uh, in JavaScript, um, all objects that you, you have are basically e expandable by design. So you can add new properties to them on the fly, uh, which is a very dynamic feature. Uh, and that is the way you, you construct objects in JavaScript. In Dart, you declare that your uh, certain class of objects will have a number of fields. And once you've created an instance of a, of a certain class, you cannot add new fields to it. So this, this, the structure uh, and the, um, uh, the, the the less flexible but much more structured approach really helps the the VM uh, run run the code faster because it doesn't have to care about or worry about people adding properties uh, to objects on the fly. Another way to look at it is uh, when we did V8, we were focusing on optimizing a a subset of JavaScript that run fast, 
And if you went outside that subset, uh, the performance would degrade. One example, if you delete a property on an object in a, in a critical path of your program, it would just slow down tremendously in, uh, in JavaScript. And that's just uh, hard to fix because JavaScript is so, um, so flexible. In Dart, uh, on the other hand, you cannot change the, the, the format of an object after it's been created. And that means that there's no subset that's fast. Uh, the whole language is fast. So that's another way of putting it. So we are trying to make sure that all programs that are written in Dart are performing really well compared to in JavaScript, where you have to, uh, to manage within a subset of it. Ah, okay. One of the things that I tell, uh, you know, new programmers when I'm teaching them is assert your assumptions. Uh, and it seems to me like by asserting those assumptions at the programming language level, you're making it a lot easier at the runtime because you're not going to pull something out from underneath them. Like you just said, like if you, uh, you know, this is an object, this is an object. No, it's not the object you thought it was. Everything you know is wrong. Now runtime, try again. You really can't be both incredibly flexible and incredibly fast, can you? Uh, unless you're very structured in your approach. And it turns out most uh, sort of proficient era script programmers, they use this subset and will uh, gain a fairly good performance out of it. But it's still uh, very dynamic. There's no static types, whereas in Dart we put in uh, optional static types. So if you want to make sure that you can, uh, that the contract between a, a user and a library is maintained, you can validate that a library is only used in a certain way. That's really hard to do in JavaScript because there's no static types. So, so static typing in Dart, then, is it really just a, a spell check? It's a, a, a more aggressive compile, or are there runtime things that are going to maybe make it slower because I use those annotations? So the um, that's two things. Uh, in the programming environment, uh, in the Dart programming environment, you can type check your program, so it can tell you if something doesn't match. But since it's mixed mode or optional typed, some code is untyped and some is typed. It's up to the programmer to decide what he wants to use. But we have a mode uh, we can run the VM in that will validate that you obey the types in the program. But when you deploy the program, you, of course, don't want to run in this validation mode and then it runs full speed. So we there's a few ways that you can validate your program behaves the way you expect it to do. We, we found that time. basically using type annotations, uh, at least... Uh, allowing people to use them as assertions in their code uh, so they can check them at runtime and the system will do that for them. Makes it a lot easier to um, track down weird issues when debugging so that if you turn this thing on, you might get the failure a lot earlier than you expected, but that will tell you much more about where this weird value turned up in the system and it will not propagate as far through the system before you can really uh, get the uh, get to the cause of it. So it, it's really, really helpful when... Um, when, when testing and validating that your software works. I have an interesting story here. We had a company that uh, had a, a group of designers. They they preferred writing in untyped code, and then they, they had the infrastructure guys that communicated with the backend. They wanted to have everything typed. And in Dart, that worked really well because when they put these two pieces of code together, they could uh, the, the infrastructure guys could validate that designers would pass in the right uh, kind of objects uh, when they test the code. So in, in such an example, they had the freedom they, they wanted and uh, at the same time could validate the program work the way it, 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 it was intended to. Interesting. That, that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, one of the other things that I think is interesting about Dart is that you, you it feels... Um, you know, it feels C-like, of course, it's class-based, it's single inheritance, but then you've got these mix-ins. Maybe you could talk about that because it seems like mix-ins are, are really gaining acceptance. But the idea that you've taken something that's very much like C and very much like Java and then something that's very much like Ruby and brought them together is really interesting. So uh, mix-ins are, it's a fairly simple concept. Uh, sometimes you want to share a code between uh, separate class hierarchies, and it's, it's, it's somewhat hard to do in most systems. Some systems allow you to do like multiple inheritance, but it gets really complicated very quickly. So you can think of a mix-in as all the methods and all the behavior from a certain class. And you, you can actually, in, in Dart, you can say that I want my class to uh, basically get the same behavior uh, as another class pulled into its definition. So you can basically have small um, units of, of behavior that you can plug into uh, different class hierarchies and get extra sharing through that. So imagine you have 
um, you want to have multiple different kinds of uh, lists or arrays in your system, but they all share a good chunk of the same behavior, like finding an element by index or something like that. You can take that behavior and put it in one place in a mixin, and then you can apply that mixin to multiple independent list implementations and get nice sharing out of that. So yeah. in many ways, it's a simple concept. So the alternative, if you don't have mixin, is you copy the code from one place to another. So you have several copies around, and uh, then it becomes really hard to maintain. So mixing, what it will help you do is to keep the code concise and make sure you don't replicate the uh, uh, behavior. One of the examples that I always try to, uh, try to use for myself to understand this is that we build the standard object-oriented animal hierarchy that we always learn in school, and then suddenly these animals know how to save themselves and, you know, save themselves, persist themselves to disk. And then this is where the student's eyes start to glaze over because it's like, well, they don't really do that. But then with a the mix-in, you could have something like persistible that has nothing to do with it. So it's almost like there's a, a, a multiple inheritance, but it's not the kind of inheritance that matters. Like the main primary inheritance is your single inheritance, and then mix-ins are, are kind of orthogonal to that. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then, so rather than interfaces uh, and then having um, things that know how to save them, the objects could really have that functionality by themselves. Uh, is it primarily to stay dry? Is it just a pragmatic thing to have mix-ins? I, I would say it is just a, a very good uh, abstraction mechanism you can use. Uh, one thing I would like to point out in Dart is that uh, uh, a class in, in Dart can be used uh, both as an interface as a class and as a mix-in. Mm -hmm. So the class concept will cover all three usage. And that's a little bit different than if you look at Java where you have explicit uh, classes and explicit interfaces. Mm -hmm. That's different than a lot of languages, isn't it? That's, it's almost like it's, you're speaking about contracts more generally. And, and, and you know, if it, if it kind of duck typing, you know, like if, yeah. if we need to use this in the context of an interface, then we just will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we found that sometimes it's really hard for people to be forced to split a class into an interface and implementation very early on in the process. So sometimes they will not do it because it feels painful. Later on, maybe someone comes along and can provide a different implementation of the same kind of class. And it's really painful that then you have to go and change the original code to allow you to do that. It's much, much nicer than you can just say, I'll hook into this and I'll make it work. And I'll just, instead of inheriting from that class, I'll just implement the same interface as it has. Um, it's, it's, it works well, really well in practice, I would say. When you're creating a language like this, um, you know, within the context of Google, you're, you're kind of, they're your benefactors, but you're not like in research. Like sometimes computer languages get created, you know, by researchers in a very um, philosophical way and up in an ivory tower somewhere. But everything I hear about you guys is pragmatism, pragmatism, pragmatism. Um, how does that work, that organizationally? So organizationally, it's, it's very simple, right? We, uh, our main goal is to make, uh, make products that work and that will make uh, programmers more productive when they write programs. It is not research. And uh, I think it's Im important that we don't see ourselves as researchers because um, um, then it sort of, it easily ends up being more advanced than you actually want for, for normal programmers. So we actually took a very, pragmatic view when you designed the language that we wanted something that was simple to understand. Actually, our, our, our model was, uh, a little bit like small, uh, small talk. That's a very, has a very simple execution model. We wanted that too. We didn't want, uh, sort of implicit conversion of objects on the fly as you have in JavaScript. So very simple. So when you looked at the program, you knew exactly what would happen when you executed it. So that was sort of the starting point of it. And of course, curly braces, you needed that because otherwise it cannot become popular. Yeah, but the uh, but I think the uh, the design of the language while doing the implementation and making sure it was fast uh, initially, I think has really helped us understand what we need to do in order to uh, evolve the language. So your goal, as you stated, is really just m you know make a great language that people will like to use. But out in the out in the in the in the world, it's kind of like the language wars, and it seems like there's almost a a, a renewed renaissance in languages. People are getting excited again about languages. There was a a very quiet period I felt in the early 2000s where it was like time to write some Java, 
and everyone was just out there writing their their boring stuff. And then suddenly we've got Rust and we've got Go and we've got Python and we've got Ruby and we're going, go, going, going, going. Talk a little bit about about Go because this is another language is that's that's coming up. Uh, are they are they comp- competing? Are they coopetition? How does that work? The, the rise of Go and the rise of Dart. I think that's um, I, it's a different programming language, so there's a little bit of competition uh, now. They're also from Google, and they're good friends of ours, <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's not a big deal. the uh, The main point I want to make is that. Uh, that Go is mostly targeting uh, server-side computation, where we are trying to be more uh, general purpose and we will also run inside the browser. Mm. And, and, and again, um, we have really tried when designing Dart to make it easy to, to start using. So our goal from the beginning was to make sure that if you had a background in JavaScript or Java or C Sharp, you will within an hour or two be up running with, uh, uh, with Dart. And that's something we have kept in mind during the whole design. And uh, I think it's pretty close to what we aimed at. Yeah, we were pretty cautious in, in the sense that if we felt like we couldn't improve something uh, dramatically, we decided to go for the familiar solution. Uh, and I think that that's paid off. And we do get the feedback that if people try this out, uh, they feel feel it's very easy to get going in it. Uh, I think Go is a... Uh, requires a little bit more of, of, of change of mind and, and coming to terms with a different kind of programming model, which to some makes it a lot more exciting. And I think that's a very good thing. Uh, but for us, I think, uh, trying to basically cater to some, uh, to the needs of, of, uh, people that just want to write their app and get it out there running very efficiently, uh, seemed like the right approach. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. One of the things that I've said to people, I think that they should, if people say, what should you learn? if you want to be a successful programmer in 2014 or in 2015. And I say, learn JavaScript or a and a systems language. So something on the front end, something on the back end. So they could learn Dart, maybe, and Java or Dart and, and Node.js on the back end or Dart and Go. So Go would be more for server side and concurrency type things. And then they could learn Dart or they could, in this case, you're saying they can use Dart as JavaScript and as serve as a system language. Yes. Now, now, then you can ask the question: Why is it important that you run the same language both on the client and on the server, right? And the holy grail, of course, is programmer productivity. So, if you can reuse the same modules in the mm-hmm. client and on the server, you save a lot of time, and it also makes it easier to uh, late in the game to change the boundary between the client and the server because it's all written in the same language. So. So certainly we see an opportunity as well in making sure that our platform uh, works well both on the server and on the client. Mm-hmm. But again, if you want to prefer uh, Java or, or Go on the server side and, and Dart on the client side, uh, more power to you. I, I think it's really important that people actually feel like it's a good thing to know more than one language. I think it makes you a much better programmer in a in a one specific, specific language if you actually is fairly proficient in other languages too. I think you really you need to expand your horizon a little bit. So even if I'd prefer people to write everything in Dart, I think it probably b- would be better for them to actually try a few things and get to terms with whatever works well in Go or Python or Rust uh, and then get back to Dart afterwards. Yeah, I think you have to find, I always say, the language of your soul, you know, the one that makes you feel good, the one that feels right in your hands, the one that feels right in your mouth. I have to give you a compliment, though. I really feel like when you go to dartlang.org, where people can learn about Dart, they can download the editor, I really like the way you said you can see Dart in about five minutes, you can write it in about an hour, and you can dive deep in about a day. It's it's really non-threatening, you know? Uh, when, when I think about some of the other languages, like if I were going to go learn, you know, R or Rust or Go, it's like, oh, I don't know if I have the mental bandwidth to just sit down and dedicate my week to learning Fulang. Uh, but, you know, like you say, with Dart and the way you set up the uh, the online stuff and getting started, it, it really is very non-threatening, and particularly around the type annotations. It's like, oh, I, I kind of know this already, don't I? And I think the um, it's important to note here because it's simple and non-threatening doesn't mean it's not expressive. Um, I still believe that we have a, a modern programming language that within a few days will make you really efficient in writing what you want. And we are, so we've been implementing languages the last, or at least for me, the last uh, 28 years or so. Uh, we have tried very hard to learn from the past and, and make it simpler. 
Yeah, it's definitely not starting from from scratch. You could say we're certainly trying to uh, to make sure that we sort of stand on the shoulders of of the giants and and that we build on top of what others found were effective ways of doing things. So we we've definitely borrowed lots of concepts from different places, and I think that's that's a good way of designing languages. I, I would say it's the only the only way, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> to abstract on the shoulders of giants is the whole is the whole point. You know, this is languages like these new languages, just because a language is new doesn't make it a toy. And this is why we, we look at the, you know, the historical context and where this language fits into the family tree of languages. And, uh, you know, the fact that this is not the, this is not your first rodeo, as we say in America, uh, you've made quite a few <laughs> virtual machines in your, in your, in your lifetimes. Um, this is a, a, a one question. I was, I was exploring and doing some research. Uh, I did see this, uh, this leaked internal mail before when Dart was called Dash. And in that mail, it's kind of a strategy mail and leaks are always unfortunate. But one of the things that is interesting in there is they talk about this idea of, of the replacement for JavaScript. Will we ever replace it? Or is it just one of those things that it'll, it'll always be with us? Is JavaScript an idea virus we can't stop? Because everyone talks about, you know, we love JavaScript, it's everywhere. We hate JavaScript, it's so broken. Why do we let it to continue? What do you think about that? So, um, what can I say? I'm thinking people, are st- okay. people are still using Cobalt. So, um, I, I, so the, web, the web browser is enormously popular, right? Uh, great advance have done to even uh, improve the ECMAScript, which is JavaScript, mm-hmm. and also the speed of it. Uh, so it'll be there for a long, long time. And uh, I didn't write the memo you're referring to. Um, no, I, I, the, I, Paul, I didn't make that clear. That was that was written by some strategy person. Okay. So um, in my mind, I'm what I'm interested in is making sure that programs have the tools they need to do to be efficient. Mm-hmm. And uh, especially when it comes to structure and large programs, we think uh, that uh, Dart provides a good solution. Mm-hmm. And in fact, we have had uh, projects uh, both inside and outside Google that we've gotten this feedback that that fairly big teams started working on Dart and uh, when they ship, they, they come back to us and say, you know what, this has been a very uh, pleasant surprise in efficiency when it came to, to build this project. And so that's basically... That's why we're doing it. Like product, productivity of developers is uh, something that most people, I think, underrate a little bit. Uh, and I think your tools really, really matter there. And you could say that we're much more interested in, in, in helping people get a choice of, of developer tools than we are in replacing anything. Uh, I think, if, if anything, uh, time has shown that there is plenty of room for lots of languages and tool chains, uh, and, uh, and they will evolve over time as well. Um, so I think the uh, one way to evaluate a good language uh, from from my perspective is if you have a debugger and when you set a breakpoint and it stops there or there's a there's a problem you can go into the debug you can understand what's happening in many program languages it's really hard to figure out what's going on and you have to put in this print statements just to make progress I think that uh, gives you a different feel that you when you stop inside the debug you know exactly how you got there there's no magic and I think if you're comfortable with everything uh, that's related to the programming language, uh, uh, you, you'll get better at doing experimentation and and also becoming a better uh, programmer. That's a really great explanation. I appreciate that because I think sometimes people who are like my, my listeners and myself as a as a you know working programmer in the world is it it's hard to separate the, the the politics of the companies and the languages, and that's why it's nice to go to the creators and really get a sense of. Hey, we're just trying to build something great, and I think you should try it. And if it's great, you should use it and yeah. and, and and separate those things. So we um, this we're sitting here in Denmark, uh, fairly far out, uh, uh, and uh, and we only have one objective that is to to make uh, make programs more efficient. And so, yeah, there's no politics here. You might hear that from strategists, but not from us. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. And then one last question I wanted to ask was that um, this isn't just something that you are just making up in Denmark. You have a specification, and this is something that you send to ECMA. Can you talk a little bit about the organization of how Dart evolves as a language? Because I know that like async and deferred loading and things like that are happening. Yes. In fact, that two days ago, uh, uh, the 
uh, ECMAScript Technical Committee TC52 approved uh, a sync await and also in NUMS uh, uh, and this part of the spec now. So we have a um, have a standardization for the program language, and we think it's important uh, if you if you're serious about uh, uh, making it a good and sustainable programming language that we can get feedback from uh, other groups using it, so they can help uh, making it a better programming language. And also, we don't want to sort of uh, uh, just change it uh, based on uh, the feel of the day. So this is a way of making sure that new language proposals are going through a process and being evaluated before it gets into the, the standard. Very cool. Well, thank you, gentlemen, so much for taking time with me today to get me up to speed and my listeners up to speed on Dart. You're very welcome. That's fun. Well, I hope you'll start using it. Uh, absolutely. Well, I'm actually, uh, w- you know, I'm taking a look at uh, the Dart editor right now. You can go up to the dartlang.org. You can download Dart and the editor. Uh, works on Windows, works everywhere. Thanks so much, gentlemen. Welcome. Thank you. Bye. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. 